Hey, all. Welcome back to another episode of the Awesome Life Podcast. I'm Karen Stultz, your host and the creator of the Awesome Life Success System and the Heart Energy Techniques that help online coaches break through some of those challenging things that seem to show up that keep them from achieving their lifestyle business the way they want it to happen. And today on the Awesome Life podcast, as you know, we always have awesome guests. And I am so excited. I can't tell you. She is a repeat guest for the Awesome Life podcast. But I have to tell you, she is one of my very best friends in the world. And she is my mentor, my friend, just an all round, my co host on. Uh, the the magical tea parties and another podcast that we host together of the Everyday Wholeness Show. So please welcome Janet Uribe. She is an amazing, amazing lady who is a channeler on our magical tea party and a wisdom beyond all wisdoms, but mostly right now, she has created a company around helping children learn how to read. And this is an inspiration, I think, for most parents, because unfortunately in our world today, a lot of kids have trouble reading. And when they are not able to read, their self-esteem goes down, and we don't need that. We need inspirational kids growing up, feeling good about themselves, and reading is a huge part of that. So welcome, 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 Janet. Thank you so much for joining me on the Awesome Life podcast, and uh, tell us more. How did you get into this uh, reading skills? Well, oh my gosh. First of all, thank you for that incredible intro. I like myself. <laughs> like, wow, I'm doing things, um, doing things that make me happy, which is what's fun. But basically, friend, I became a teacher years ago and found that I didn't fit in as a teacher. I did not follow the rules. It did not align with me that we teach children to a certain curriculum, a standard, a benchmark, a federal mandate. And then whether they have mastered it or not, we pass them on to the next year. And so I originally started off working with a lot of inner city dynamics. Um, and while there, I realized that when I would work with children and meet them where they were, I had no behavioral issues. Mm. But when we're teaching children to a curriculum that or a material or a content or asking them to read things that they're not able to well I can't do that I'm going to delay a void I'm going to go visit my friend over here I'm going to create issues I'm not going to have you tell me another day of my life that I can't do this so to me it's really fascinating because you know me Karen I like I see spirit in all things what happens in the school system is actually what happens in all of our systems. When someone does not feel capable, when someone does not feel confident, they're not going to step into their creativity. They're not going to step into their true power. They're not going to look into perspective. They're going to chronically feel frustrated. And then things like self-esteem really take a tank. Um, they really take a true beating and we wonder why we carry around all of this difficulty with us. Well, it's very similar to what we do as humans with our trauma. We'll create an unresolved issue, which becomes trauma, an unresolved conflict, and we'll carry it around with us forever until it gets addressed, until it gets resolved. And then once it's addressed and resolved, we are free. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I can... I, I am one that can attest to this. If my mom tried so hard to help me read and I don't know for sure what the situation was. All I know is that my brothers and sisters were A students 
And I was lucky to get a D if I was really, really lucky. And it, it was a challenge. I hated reading. I was ashamed because even though in school, they didn't want to say high, medium, and low reading levels, you knew that the Robins were really dumb and they couldn't read and they couldn't comprehend and talk about low self-esteem. And that it could be because I fell out of a car when I was three years old and kind of joggled my head, or it could be because I have dyslexia, or it could be, or it could be, or it could be. The bottom line was the trauma was there because I could not read. And until I was 16 and I was forced to read, um, I was one of those, those kids. And my mom sent me to different places to learn. And I was just like you were talking about being able to say, hey, I got a nice smile, like me. That's yeah. all I really need. Watch me go under a different radar. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I was the same, you know, I grew, I had immigrant parents. Uh, reading was not something I witnessed very much on my, in my household, except for maybe a periodic newspaper to be read, but my parents weren't reading to us. Um, so similarly also having English as my second language, reading was not my strength. So, you know, putting mine aside and then like kind of magnifying the commonality that we have, right. You and I, and millions of others mm -hmm. were sent to an institution where this is where the majority of the majority of the day is based in reading. The majority of the day is based in you comprehending what you did, what you read. So immediately you start to isolate, you start to create what I'll call like a fake identity around who you really are. Yeah. You'll start to view yourself as incapable or I am one of the Robins. Don't you know, they're the blue Jays. I'm yeah. a Robin. Yeah. And the second we start participating in these degrees of separation, then we create a whole cataclysmic problem for ourselves because we're creating more of the separation with who we really are. And so I created this program basically because one, I'm an intuitive teacher. <laughs> so there's that. There's not many of us out there that I know of. I've seen some that have great intuition, but I don't know if we're all out the box or out, you know, in public. <laughs> Yeah. Well, th this is true. And that's another whole part of Janet and my relationship, her, her intuitive skills help with the students that you're working with right now and with your, your company that you, and, and programs that you have created. Yeah, basically. So um, the idea just me, it, it's so simple because I'm sitting here, I'm telling you, I'm tapping into this. I'm tapping into the emotion. I'm tapping into the psychology. I'm tapping into the skill. But there are ways for us to fix this collectively for a student. And it really just starts with meeting them where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, basically what we're doing to kids, you know, we're asking them to run when some of them haven't even learned how to walk. Yeah. And we're pushing more content, more curriculum at them when really we could just teach them a skill. To just teach them the skill and then they'll read anything. And that's really what I, I prioritize my work around. And so I do in-person teaching with children. And I also do teacher training for teachers and, and different programs so that I can actually explain what's necessary to help transform a child's academic ability. And I noticed that in about three to five months, I typically can change their skill about one to two full grade levels. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. It really truly is amazing because so many of these kids are, are, so challenged. So what age groups do you deal with, Jen? Oh my gosh. I have taught as young as four and as and like 44 has been my oldest student. So uh, really there's no limitation on the age. It just depends on what we're looking to accelerate, what we're looking to grow. Um, and then how many exposures does it take for each child to get their own aha moment around a skill or adult? Mm-hmm. So with your intuitiveness, you're also able to help them see things in a different yes. respect. Of yes, exactly. So I also, when I'm meeting with children, it is not solely academic time. A lot of times I'm, I already am dealing with someone who has spent the last four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine years going to a place that tells them they are something other than what they are. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of emotional component that has to come forward with making a child feel valued, helping them recognize their worth, helping them see that they are capable of learning, helping them see that they're capable of growth and growth mindset's a huge component of it. But yes, when they come in, it does help that I'm intuitive because I can already tell what they like. (laughs) (laughs) I can already build rapport. I can already tell what they, you know, if they had a hard time with mom or dad or a sibling that morning, and we'll talk about biting them later in the day, we're just cutting up a lot with them and, and having fun, making light of things so that they don't necessarily always have to associate with the idea that school is hard. I also do this with their parents. I actually coach and mentor spiritually um, some of my students' parents to also kind of do like a collective practice for a child who needs their life changed. And then for people who are not as well, the idea is the same. If you think about it, we all go to earth school (laughs) where we're told that we are something and we believe it with such conviction that we have to now rewrite our story to really see who we really are. And I tell you, Janet is an amazing mentor and and coach around that. She has helped me shift like you would not believe. And it's it's such a, a joy. It's such a joy. It's fun. It's definitely fun. I'll say that. It's neat because a lot of times I'll have people tell me, you know, how do you how do you know this? You know, how how do you understand this? And I've <laughs> I laugh because I tell them, because I've gone through it (laughs) because I go through it as you go through it. Perhaps we go through it at different levels or different um, themes, different topics, but similarly, we're all kind of going through the same thing. Um, And it's really about just being able to pinpoint what it is for that person that day. And that's where the intuition is really fun. I love doing it for kids because sometimes I feel like the kids know that I'm reading it. So that adds this whole other level. Also something that's really neat. I don't even know how this happens, but the universe keeps sending me little kids who are very intuitive or very empathic. (laughs) (laughs) So they can read on me just like I can read on them. I love how that works. You know, it's, I guess it's like a law of attraction, vibrational match type of thing. Uh, That, well, it makes sense. That makes sense. But don't you think too, that kids also know how to tweak your buttons. Oh yeah, they're supposed to. (laughs) Let's talk about that. For any viewers, guardians, parents, aunts, uncles, siblings, grandparents, whatever it is, whoever you are, they're meant to do that. That is their purpose. (laughs) To help us grow with the button pushing, right? Mm -hmm. They're meant to actually be an extension of who you are in your soul family. And they're meant to come in to push the very buttons that you have not yet opened Mm. and in, or I'll push it even further. Have not yet accepted about your true self. Ah, that is so cool. That is so cool. It really is. on, On the magical tea party, which I will put in to the show notes for, for Janet and I, uh, we invite you to come where, where Janet can really tune in and, and help you as a, a listener to the awesome life podcast, uh, really maybe get a different perspective between the two of us and the other people who are there at the tea party, uh, share lots of wonderful information there, but now you you've had this program for students but i think if i understood correctly and tell me if i'm wrong you actually have your own program that you have developed using all kinds of stuff and created so that parents could access your reading skill even if they're not in the austin texas Area. Yeah. So recently I did, I started creating basically everything from like early literacy program. They're very simple, very basic. The videos are short. And the idea is to just start equipping parents for the very skills that are so simplistic that we want a child to be able to master as they're be able to enter the institution. <laughs> I call it the institution because 
there are so many rules and mandates and structures and things. And let me tell you what, I'm all about the kids going into it because the whole reason we come in as humans is because we have to learn how to break out of the paradigms. And so what better system that we have created <laughs> <laughs> to put all of the kids and shuffle them in order into, into those paradigms for them to really be forced to identify who am I? So the idea being in these videos, I am basically providing tools, accesses, resources for parents to know how to instruct their kid, activities they can do that relate to anything from colors and shapes to prepositions and just things that they need to feel equipped in school. Because really that's where a lot of that psychological mind game starts to happen is when they don't feel equipped, who wants to go somewhere where they feel ill-equipped every day? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So do you have any examples that you could share with our listeners who might be needing a little? Um, sure. Absolutely. So like right now, I'm actually about to launch this. So it'll be right in time for your listeners to get access to this. I have been seeing tons of, of kids who are clearly walking around with COVID year deficits. So COVID year was really interesting for some schools is a year and a half for others. It was two years that they did online schooling. And um, right now I'm only focusing this towards uh, pre-K towards second grade. I will be branching out into higher grades later on, but right now I really just know that those are the foundational years and we learn how to read between pre-K to, to, to second grade. And then after that, you now read to learn. So your window that the school offers you is not very big. And I don't necessarily agree with the window because developmentally, some children aren't even ready to read until they're seven. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not really developmentally aligned with where children are. And so what I've created is an assessment and you can actually get this for free. And, and this assessment, you can just download it and it'll come with the videos and it'll show you where your child is performing and if they need more instruction to fill in gaps. The reason being is they're not automated on certain skills like basic letters and letter recognition formation. Then it's not a surprise to me when you end up with a third, fourth or eighth grader that doesn't like writing because it was never mastered in kinder first or second. So you're also teaching them to write? Is yeah, there are some programs that will, yeah, it's actually a secondary part of my program, but yes, reading, writing, um, kind of go hand in hand. I say that writing is the active form of reading. So mm. if you can read it, then now we're talking about making the expressive component of writing it. So they do go hand in hand. And yeah, I've basically been hand piecing these programs together for about a year and I still have so much more to do, but I do know that it will continue to grow. Um, my company 10 times itself in a year. So <laughs> I know what I'm doing works. I have great success. I have last year, I had 34 students fail the local standardized test that we do here in Texas called the star test and all 34 passed this year. So I know that there's a simple recipe of just meeting someone where they are. And you know what I'm talking about also, Karen, as like a coach and basically a mentor as well. You meet someone where they are and you build the stepping stones from there. Right. Yeah. And the traditional systems have us meeting people above their heads or right where they are, but we don't build scaffolding to get them where they need to be. And that's what my programs do. We build the scaffolded steps to be able to get a child where they need to be. That is fantastic. That really is huge. And the kids um, not only read, but end up enjoying Oh yeah, reading, they love them. looking, looking for places and books to read, which is remarkable, really. It's one thing to be able to read and write, but it's another thing entirely to enjoy it. And after you've been um, cultured not to enjoy it for so long, yeah, it, it's uh, and, and to try not to read or understand um, for so long in school. And like I say, that's me, that's me. Uh, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But to be able to understand and, and enjoy it is a, again, a gift. So when you say that you were able to bring those kids from um, failing the 
the uh, STAR test to passing. Is this on a, a grade level STAR test or, or yeah. is it a pass fail? All right. So it's a grade level. So most, a lot of my kids, I would say failed it multiple years in a row. Okay. Yeah. So basically if I have a child who's failing a such an assessment multiple years in a row, that means that there is a huge discrepancy of where their reading skills are. Mm. So they're probably more than a year or two behind in that case. Now, what's fascinating, and I'm going to relate this to our spiritual environments, okay? We can meet teachers. We can meet coaches. We can meet guides. We can meet facilitators. We can meet healers. We can meet all of this that know the talk. You get what I'm saying. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. Um, But it's a totally other one. It's very different to have someone who can integrate your steps for you and help you really grasp them so that you can make your own next step. So that is what I do for children in those assessments or in those styles. I never teach to the assessment ever. I don't keep those things around. I just meet them where they are to basically help them grow that way. And when when they pass, do they just pass or do they really like um, these? As long as there is not an underlying disability. Okay. I would say dyslexia or something like that. You mean? I would say we hit mastery, but even so I have plenty of kids with dyslexia who hit mastery too. Um, it's really neat. It's it's fascinating really, because when, what I was going to get at a moment ago is, you know, in this world where we can cognitively know something as teachers, as guides, as leaders, this applies to children. We can teach them how to do these things. We can teach them the steps. We can teach them the hows. But if we haven't actually worked on the neurology, the physical component, the mind, both to believe that it can, and also to create the new firing pathway to practice the skill Will it then show up when it's time to to perform per se, or to take a test or to, to read and to comprehend something. But similarly, the brain can, you know, some, I would say some of my most common students that I have, they're kids that read beautifully. They sound lovely when they read, but they're not remembering or comprehending what they read. So we're really talking about a huge, a much bigger complexity of the brain that uses the frontal lobe, but also uses every other component as well to make semantic and meaning happen. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a lot of isolated practice to do that. And just like us on our journey here as people, it takes a lot of isolated practice in many different things that we're experimenting with or dabbling with or learning (laughs) to really hit a level of mastery with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that because in truth, our children are the future. And the more that we can help our kids feel good and confident about themselves, the better our future will be. Yeah, absolutely. And that's honestly why I show up to do this. I think as a little girl, I knew I wanted to teach the teachers. I I knew that somehow. I knew that that reaches more population, more people. It makes a larger ripple effect and impact versus just working with one or two children at a time, which is also a beautiful impact and ripple on its own. But being able to create programs that help teach teachers to feel good about what they do and help them feel accomplished and successful in what they do. Because something that we've gotten away from as a society is, okay, now we're going to teach this curriculum and this historical concept and this and this. And we teach so much content so much content on the front end that we forgot to teach these guys how to run and walk (laughs) and everything else in between. So it's no wonder that we keep finding ourselves with kids, you know, they're engaging in things that they feel good in. They're engaging with their games. They're engaging with their gaming or their sports or their other activities, because this is where they feel that they perform well. This is where they feel confident. So my biggest goal is to bring confidence back into reading across the globe, really. I mean, that would be phenomenal. And when you just think of the amount of world issues that we have, that many people on this earth currently have the psychological construct to start repairing But if you don't feel confident in something, then why engage? 
Exactly. Is it worth the time, energy, or money? That's exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, so is there an exercise that you could share or is it all in your video? Is there an exercise I could share? I could share. What do I have around here? <laughs> Let me grab something. One of the things that I have noticed, my friends, and it's been fascinating to me to watch as I sit here and I'm reaching across to get a pencil. I would love to share this as just a simple thing. I can't tell you how many kids I have right now that are not confident writers. And let me show you why. This is how they hold their pencil. Oh my goodness. Uh-huh. Oh my. They, it's kind of crazy how many I get a year. That Really? Hold. Yeah. And so the hand has a great difficulty having to manipulate this. So I'm going to give you an example of something I do in one of my early videos that I do for toddlers. I talk about the grasping, the mm -hmm. pincer, and how important it is to start practicing those types of skills when they're very little, because we have to be able to get to a pencil with a pincer grasp. Ah. And I have 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds who hold it like I've Brilliant. never, ever yeah. really, I, I was always curious as to why they might be doing that. But you're saying that it is a very common thing. It's much more common than I've ever seen. I think that we just live in a very different society than we used to with pushing more in the school systems. And um, of course, we have more technology, keyboards, you know, mm -hmm. make those thumbs move nice and fast, but not oh, yeah. the rest of the fingers, right? I have students who can type their whole essay in yeah. a second on their thumbs. But yeah, the thing is, when it comes to something as simple as this, I have parents who are like, I don't know why they don't like to write. And I'm telling them because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so basically my videos are very much catered from very early on, you know, 18 months and up. What does it look like for us to start teaching the very skills that eventually build to a classroom so that we're not chronically frustrated in a classroom? I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. And, and guys, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm looking at Janet and you have to come over to YouTube conversations to, mm -hmm. to see her, her explanation with a pincher uh holding <laughs> pencil but uh I, I I always love my conversations with Janet and we're always looking at each other so I totally forgot that this is also a podcast that we're doing <laughs> it is also a podcast <laughs> <laughs> so come on over to YouTube and and look at the uh conversations so so yeah. how can people reach out to you how can people ask help from you? So you can find me at readingskillscenter.com. Um, if you're here in the local Austin area, I do work with individuals, children, and parents in person. Um, but if you're looking to do something online, I can consult and explain things that would be necessary to help a child or so on online as well. And then my programs are also accessible on readingskillscenter.com. Um, we're again, I'm new-ish, but I plan to have several things up there for everyone very soon. And then I'll also have everything from homeschooling programs to teacher training and so on. And just a, a bunch of freebies too, guys. There's some things that I just feel like kids need to know. And I'm all about sharing freebies. Why not? <laughs> hey, we're all in this together. We're mm -hmm. all in this. And there is no one thing because everything that we do influences somebody else. Always. Absolutely. So make sure that what you are doing is a positive, uplifting, uh, confidence builder, whatever it might be. I love it. Oh, Janet, thank you so, so much. And all of her, her link and everything is going to be in the show notes. So be sure to check out the show notes, learn more about Janet Uribe. And she is, she's, just absolutely remarkable. Just ask anybody who comes to the magical tea party and me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I love, I love, love, love the fact that her kids enjoy coming to her and learning and really do move up grade levels in as little as three or four or five months. Yeah. 
when they've yeah. been struggling for so long. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. But before we go, is there any last word that you would like to share with our listeners? Oh, my friend, thank you so much, guys, for listening. If you have a child who is struggling, take a moment, sit down and find out what's really at the root of their struggle. This applies to academics or it applies to emotional psychological components as well. It's not typically what you think is the trouble. And I will leave you with that, my friends. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, until the next time, have an awesome life. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.